The half res conference announces its return to Chicago, Blender users gain more MoGraph tools, and we explore some deep cut After Effects features and workflows. It's Motion Mondays, or is it? It is. Here's a bit of MoGraph trivia for you. Do you know the origin of the sheep noise in Adobe After Effects? <laughs> Stick around until the end to find out. Kyle Webster, the digital brush wizard, has a new home at Procreate. After leaving Adobe, who had acquired him and his amazing brush making skills, Kyle didn't stay on the market for too long. It's a natural fit. Kyle is a well-known figure in the illustration community and a genius at making brushes. He's also an incredible artist. Kyle will be working closely with Procreate's development team to improve their brush performance and their brush library. I bet that this means we're gonna get even better brushes and Procreate's brushes are already very, very good. We're looking forward to hearing more from Kyle. He's probably got a bit more leeway now to speak his mind and influence the industry's direction. So congrats, Kyle, and a big congrats to our friends at Procreate. Wayback Animation Studio in India went viral with a cool visual effects shot involving a blender scene coming to life, and it reminded me of Chris Theron's piece that went mega viral last year. What's cool about both is that going viral is now a valid marketing tactic for studios, motion designers, and 3D artists. Our work is native to digital social media platforms, and we have a unique combo of compositing, design, and animation skills. This means it's feasible for one motion designer with a good idea to execute it and get it out into the world. Plus, viral content tends to look unpolished, like it was shot on an iPhone or something, so you can get away with slightly lower production value. With the slow year that many artists had last year and are still having this year, this is a cool way to combine useful things for freelancers like doing spec work, expanding your portfolio, learning new skills, and getting your name out there. It's the kind of marketing that many companies want right now. Chris also posts breakdowns of his work, and I've always said that showing behind the scenes breakdowns is very smart. It demonstrates to clients that you didn't just get lucky or buy a plugin, you have a process and you know what you're doing. So if they have notes or different ideas, you're showing that you can create any video that they can dream up. So follow Chris and Wayback Studio for inspiration on marketing your skills creatively. Today is day one of orientation week for our summer session for all of our interactive classes at School of Motion. There's still time to jump into the session. We've got some spots open. And remember that not only can you learn After Effects, Cinema 4D, design, animation, visual effects, character animation, illustration, and more, but you'll learn it with a group of students from all around the world who are pushing themselves to get better, just like you. You get unlimited critique on your work from one of our teaching assistants. You get access to monthly live streams and so much more. If you're looking to upgrade your skills this summer, now is the time to jump in. Registration will officially close this Thursday and we hope to see you in class. Womp, one of two apps that now exist as a cloud-based 3D application that uses this sort of goofy, goopy, squishy modeling technology, has just released a 3D asset library. You can check it out by activating the 14-day free trial at the site and heading over to the new Assets tab. This library includes over a thousand pre-made assets you can import directly into your scenes. It really shows off Womp's ability to get very organic 3D shapes, typically with less work than in a traditional hard surface modeling workflow. A lot of the assets are essentially 3D icons you could use for adding extra visual flair to your scene or common visual metaphor elements like gears and warning signs. Many seem like they'd work really well as visual assets for social media posts or web design. But here's something cool you may not know. Let's say we check out this pizza slice asset. You can use it in your scene, and if you haven't played around with Womp, it's a really fun app to use. It feels like you're using a GPU accelerated renderer in your web browser. You have full control over materials and colors in your scene, and here's the kicker. You can export Womp scenes in many different 3D mesh formats, including GLTF. Now, what's special about GLTF? Well, it's a format that the relatively new Adobe After Effects 3D system can understand, and you get the textures imported automatically. You can import the GLTF file into After Effects, drag it into a scene. I found that you have to set the object scale pretty small, and now you have a textured and fully 3D object inside of After Effects in just a minute. You get a lot of the material properties this way, and for simple 3D icons and models, it's actually a really useful technique to create or find assets for your After Effects comps. Womp and Adobe's Project Neo are now in a race to create the best version of this type of cloud-based 3D app, so check out Womp's new asset library and let us know what you think in the comments. Speaking of browser-based animation apps, there's another one making the rounds on social media. A little over a week ago, a Reddit user posted that they had created a free After Effects alternative called Picky Move. It's currently 100% free 
free, no sign up required, no file uploads, no AI, and it's completely browser based. Now the app is pretty surprising in its capabilities, although as you can imagine for a very new animation tool, there are hundreds of features that you would need to actually replace After Effects that it just doesn't have. And frankly, I'm not sure how feasible it is to build a fully featured animation and compositing application in the browser with one person developing it, but as a proof of concept, it's pretty interesting. It has a timeline, real-time playback, keyframes, and different easing types, and it can even use 3D models and scenes. But as I mentioned, it has very, very limited features at this time. The one and only Jonathan Winbush did a short review video of it. We'll link to that in the description to give you more insight into what this tool offers. At this point, it's not really gonna be all that useful for professional motion designers, but maybe with a few more years of development, it could turn into something really cool. As a technical demo and as a proof of concept, it's already pretty impressive though. We'll be keeping an eye on Picky Move, so check out Winbush's review and let us know what you think. I keep hearing that one of the main reasons Cinema 4D artists stick with C40 for so long, even with tools like Blender being free and powerful, is because C4D has the amazing MoGraph tool set, which lets you get very abstract, cool results without having to be nearly as technically inclined as say a Houdini user. Well, Blender doesn't have tools like that built in. It's got a really cool feature called geometry nodes, which can give you those capabilities, but that's a far more manual process. So enter Spanish Blender artist, Manuel Lopez, who's been working on a plugin for Blender called B4D Tools. Now, personally, I might be a little more careful when poking the trademark bear that way. However, the tool itself seems very cool. There's a new version out that adds a whole bunch of features to replicate the functionality you get with Cinema 4D's MoGraph tool set. He's improved the fall off system it ships with six cloner types that'll be familiar to C4D users. There are now 14 different effectors and a bunch of other tools useful for doing the kind of abstract 3D that motion designers typically do. The plugin is very inexpensive at only $15 and Blender, as EJ likes to remind me, is free. I think for Blender users, this is awesome. I have slightly mixed feelings about it only because one of the things that artists sometimes take for granted is how important it is, especially for larger studios, to have confidence in a tool's development, bug fixes, and technical support. If you're working on, say, a Hollywood feature film with crazy deadlines and dozens of artists on different shots, you need faith that you won't hit a show-stopping bug with no way to fix it. So relying on a third-party tool developed by one person that's on sale for $15 means there's not some well-capitalized business behind it to reach out to if something goes wrong. And I'm starting to wonder if this market dynamic is one reason why in motion design, Cinema 4D is still far and away the king in the 3D world. I actually discussed this in an upcoming podcast episode with our very own Aaron Rabinowitz, who has worked at big software companies like Red Giant and Maxon. But I haven't used the tool and it does look very, very cool. So if you've used it, please let us know in the comments what you think and let me know what your thoughts are on my theory that Blender's open source nature and enormous ecosystem of inexpensive plugins is both a pro and a con for gaining market share in the professional world. Mark your calendars on Friday, September 20th, the annual Half Res Conference will be held again in Chicago. I got a chance to speak at this conference a couple of years ago, and it's really amazing. You have hundreds of motion designers from all over the country, frankly, all over the world, coming to an amazing city to eat deep dish pizza, hang out, and geek out on lots of topics related to motion design. It's always a lot of fun. There are great speakers. The organizers do an amazing job, and there are often panels discussing things like AI, burnout, business, self-promotion, and much more. Head to halfres.com and click on the notify me button so you can be alerted when tickets go on sale. This event has sold out in the past and it's a great excuse to get to Chicago. Last week was the 4th of July, American Independence Day, and I always get a little patriotic on July 4th. So I wanted to include this throwback piece that was one of the gateway drugs for me back in the day, really solidifying my love of motion design. This is a piece called the Gettysburg Address, an early example of the kinetic typography visual essay genre. It's directed by Adam Galt and Ted Katsaftis, the founders of Block and Tackle Studio. Now this piece is 10 years old, but it still holds up and it's beautiful to watch. There's a lot of great type transitions in it. I love the very, very restrained color palette. There's just not a lot of flash to it. It's subtle, it's well-designed, and it's really great to watch. So check that out. And if you wanna learn more about Block and Tackle, we did interview them a few years back. You can find that interview on our site. The link will be in the description. And you can learn more about these incredible talents. Some more Blender news. So Blender 4.2 LTS has entered beta before the public release. Now, what is the LTS version? I actually didn't know about this. The Blender Foundation puts out a version of Blender called LTS for long-term support. 
Now, you may be aware that Blender updates very frequently because it's open source, so there can always be lots of people contributing to it. However, if you're operating a studio built on a Blender pipeline, you probably want to find a version that's stable and works for you and lock that in for all of your artists for a certain amount of time to avoid any technical issues. That's what the long-term support version of Blender is for, and these are released less frequently, typically every two years, and prioritize stability and performance over new features. But there are some big new features in this new long-term support version. There have been updates to Eevee, which is Blender's real-time rendering engine, including a big update to volumetric lighting. Blender's compositor has added GPU-accelerated compositing of your renders, and there's a whole bunch more. You can check out the release notes to find out everything that's changed in the new version. If you test it out and it's working well for you, you can know that this version will remain stable until the next long-term support release. And watch out for more Blender content from us as we start diving into this really exciting 3D app. The Mothers of MoGraph Summer Collection has dropped, so if you're looking for some MoGraph swag, now's the time to get in. There are some really cool designs, some unique illustrations, including tank tops, t-shirts, and a denim bucket hat, which is handy for those of us that have to really worry about getting sunburnt on our scalps at the beach. And of course, being on brand, there are onesies if you have little motion designers in your house that need to represent. So check out the Mothers of MoGraph Summer Collection. The link will be in the description. Eleven Labs, known for their AI-generative voiceover tools, has released something very cool and I think very useful. It's called Voice Isolator, and it uses AI to remove background noise from any audio clip. To demonstrate, the team literally blew a leaf blower at someone who was talking into a microphone and then removed the leaf blower noise. <laughs> Need to remove background noise from your video? Use our new voice isolator model for crystal clear audio every time. You know, I remember having to go to mix sessions and pay very highly trained engineers hundreds of dollars an hour to get about 25% of this result. So this is a big deal. You can go to 11 Labs site right now and try it yourself. If you're a video editor or just trying to build an audio bed and you've got talking that isn't quite pristine, try using this tool and see the results you get. Now, last week, we talked about Artlist's new AI voiceover tool, and I wasn't very impressed with it. A bunch of you wrote in and said that Eleven Labs has much better models and a little bit more control. So for those of you watching who saw last week's episode, check out Eleven Labs if this is something that might be useful in your work. And just so it's said, I wanna be clear, I think just like we have a debate around the ethics of AI-generated images and videos and how those models are trained, we also need to be aware of how these audio models are trained. I have it on very good source that the Artlist model was trained on actors who knew exactly what their voices were going to be used for and were compensated for that. Eleven Labs has done something similar, having licensed the voices of some famous celebrities like Burt Reynolds, Judy Garland, James Dean, and Sir Lawrence Olivier for use in their Reader app, which can read books, articles, and any other text using one of their voices. The results are crazy. It's honestly kind of mind-blowing to hear Judy Garland read the text of The Wizard of Oz. At that moment, Dorothy saw lying on the table the silver shoes that had belonged to the Witch of the East. And I don't think you have to try very hard to imagine where this is going. So I'm happy to see that Eleven Labs does seem very interested in doing this ethically and making sure that people's voices are not being used without their consent, which, as someone on my team pointed out, is basically identity theft. These kinds of licensing deals and this technology are gonna open up a lot of crazy opportunities for creators. So we'll be watching closely. Let us know what you think in the comments. It's now time for the School Motion Student of the Week. Christina Agapito from the Spring Session of Design Bootcamp finished up her final project for Premium Beat. This project gives you a script and a style guide and asks you to create a set of boards for a branding piece for the popular stock music website. Looking at these boards, what I love is how strong the compositions are and how well Christina used contrast to draw your eye exactly where she wants it to go. This is one of the things we hammer pretty hard in that course, how to draw the viewer's eye to the right place on your frame. There's also some great textures, some really cool concepts here, and a great mix of design elements, compositing, and footage that was actually provided by Premium Beat. One of the things I love is when I look at a set of boards and I can already kind of see them moving, which I can definitely do with this set of boards. So Christina, congrats, these are amazing. I can't wait to see what you do next. Here's someone you should be following on social media, Matt Volpe, the founder of Tax Studio in Manchester, UK. There are a few cool things about the studio and what I see Matt doing. First of all, they've niched down pretty well, positioning themselves as a place to go for animation templates and mogurts, creative automation solutions, toolkits, and things like that. So they're offering motion design services, but for a very specific use case where there's not really a ton of competition out there doing exactly this kind of thing. 
Recently, Matt has been dropping a series of videos covering lesser known features in After Effects, showing off some things that, especially if you've been using After Effects for two decades, you may just have missed or may not really use because you already had workarounds or other ways of doing things. He shows off things like the Mask Feather tool, the secret project that gets snuck into the app with each release by the After Effects team, an auto keyframe setting that can automatically set keyframes even if there are not keyframes already on that property, and a setting that lets you turn on a visual indicator for a keyframes index, which can be very handy if you're trying to sync animations between different layers. He's got a whole series of these, so go follow him and then check out a tool that he just released called Quality Control. You can get it at aescripts.com. It's 25% off until July 20th, and it lets you manage the preview render quality of your projects more easily. You can set up low, medium, and high quality settings and activate each with one click. This includes composition settings like motion blur or aliasing quality, layer properties like turning effects and layers on and off, and much more. So if you're working with really dense comps where you're constantly having to turn things on and off so you can work and then turn things back on to render, this would save you a lot of time. I love seeing tools like this because you can tell that they come from someone who intimately understands the process of working in After Effects and they've scratched their own itch and then open that up to the community. So go check out Quality Control, give Matt a follow and Matt, thank you for your service. Finally, one more piece of AI news. Luma AI, who have released the Dream Machine text-to-video model, have added a new feature called keyframes. This feature lets you feed the model multiple images and then it will interpolate between those images automatically. People have been having a lot of fun with this on the internet. I don't know if you've seen this video, but these are just memes morphing into other memes. It's kind of wild how the tool just sort of figures out what the camera should be doing and tries to, as seamlessly as possible, get from one meme to another. Creators have been playing with this and making some really interesting results. And while I'm not sure how actually useful a lot of these things are in practice, I did think that this example was interesting. The Eiffel Tower transitioning from a daytime shot to a nighttime shot. This is like a pretty standard piece of B-roll that you might need at some point, but if this tool can create clips like this simply by feeding it to images, I think a really creative artist could come up with use cases for this and get results that are not really possible in any other way without an obscene amount of work. You can feed the model real images too, so you can do things like this hyperlapse here from spring to winter. Now, of course, you're gonna notice that most of these creations have that kind of AI look that I feel nine times out of 10, you can just spot instantly. And there's all kinds of issues with the movement and stuff like that. So again, I don't know how really useful this is in practice professionally, but I think that's where professional motion designers who are okay with using these tools can play around with them and maybe come up with some use cases that are actually useful and save time and open up capabilities that didn't exist before. Like this example, this is a music video just released by the awesome band Starset, where they paid artists to train an AI model on their work to enable them to create the animations and to lean into the weird, uncanny quality of AI video. The song is actually pretty anti-AI, and it uses the aesthetic on purpose. And it seems to me that this video just could not have been created with this vision without those tools. We've been covering AI a lot on Motion Mondays lately because frankly, it's a revolution in the way images and video get created, and I would feel really silly to not cover these things, but I've been thinking a lot about my own opinion on these tools, and especially on the ethics of them. I think the ethical conversation is really important but I also think that talking about how practical these tools are is important. Out of all of the amazing advances that AI has already produced, like AI-generated voiceover, chat GPT, AI-generated imagery, AI-generated video is still not really there. While it keeps getting better and better, my take is that these tools for most professional applications, they need to give you 99% of what you want, not 92%, not 93%. And if they can't, you need to be able to fix what they give you to get the rest of the way. The tool sets for these things are just not there yet. For images, different story, maybe for voiceovers, different story, but for video, and especially for stylized 2D animation, I don't think these tools, even as impressive as they are, are anywhere close to being something that an animator could use daily. In any case, head to Luma Labs AI if you're curious to check out Dream Machine. You can try it now. Let us know what you think in the comments. And that's it for this episode of Motion Mondays. Let's talk about that After Effects sheep noise. So if you've used After Effects for a while, you know it's the sound you hear when a render fails. But there's more to the story. Apparently, the mother of one of the original software developers recorded that noise. Now that is talent. It started as an Easter egg in an early version of the app where you could click various places in the interface to trigger the sound. So when they needed an alert for failed renders, they just used that sound because it was already there. I tried to find the name of the person who actually made the sound, but I didn't have any luck. So if you know the person behind the iconic render fail sound, please let us know in the comments. We'd love to give her a shout out. 
And I'd love for these videos to be more of a conversation, so please leave a comment. Hit the like button, make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss our weekly news updates, plus all of the interviews and other content we put out. We've got some great guests booked on the podcast in the next few months, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of that either. And there's still time to sign up for the summer session of our classes, so head over to schoolmotion.com for all the details. We hope to see you in class. Have an awesome week. Oh,